Uh, because preventive medicine is not just about diagnostic tests, but also about creating specific devices that can help doctors and uh, patients to much um, uh, sooner detect problems and, and uh, diseases. For example, a smartphone can be used to analyze your voice to predict your risk of heart disease, Parkinson's disease, depression. Or imagine you, fall, you feel to start sick and you start to cough. So your smartphone could analyze the sound of your cough and determine whether this cough is caused by uh, asthma or bronchitis or pneumonia and so on. There are also other companies working on uh, you, uh, making use of your uh, camera and your smartphone, your selfie camera, for example, um, that could track your eye movements to predict your risk of cognitive decline. And there are also companies that are looking into, for example, uh, using AI to track your swiping behavior to also diagnose psychiatric disorders or dementia. Scopes that can use AI to analyze um, uh, your heart rhythm, for example, is ACG uh, results or your heart murmurs to diagnose uh, specific problems in the heart. Um, we also invested in EXO, which creates handheld ultrasound devices. Um, and uh, there is also this uh, application of AI that uh, can analyze these ultrasound images to diagnose uh, specific uh, diseases. And of course, this plays into this revolution or uh, evolution that we are seeing. Like not until so long ago, an uh, ultrasound device was a very bulky device you, that you had to roll around and that cost uh, uh, between twenty and $200,000. Then you have companies like EXO creating these handheld ultrasound devices. And we will go to a future where patients just stick it on their body like a patch or where um, it's integrated in clothing or uh, in your smartwatch or uh, bracelets and so on. And that's, of course, very interesting uh, because you can then track your health at home. And this evolution will also enable much better preventive medicine and continuous more personalized uh, medicine. And of course, besides these technologies, another example of technologies we invest in are organ and tissue regeneration. An example is Sigillon, that's encapsulating specific cells uh, so that they are protected from the immune system. And then the cells are, uh, and capsules are injected in the abdominal cavity where, it, where they can stay for six months uh, or longer. We also invest in companies like, like Genesis that are injecting liver cells uh, into lymph nodes to grow uh, livers inside those lymph nodes. Uh, so you have like an extra organ and uh, these liver cells know when to stop growing, uh, when they sense that the blood is filtered and, uh, and clean, cleansed enough, uh, which could be very interesting um, to postpone the need for liver transplantations um, altogether even. And this plays into this development where organs are grown, for example, in bioreactors or ideally in humans or even animals like some other companies are also doing. So we have like a bit of uh, two approaches towards this new uh, biotech and longevity uh, revolution. You have people who are, who are very optimistic and that think that these new technologies will enable us to live much, much longer than uh, what would be the biological plateau of our species, which would be around 120 years. But if we could uh, partially reverse aging or substantially slow down the aging process, we could perhaps uh, uh, push through that plateau of 120 years. And then there are scientists with more uh, subdued uh, visions uh, saying that, well, it's just great that uh, the paradigm shift is unfolding um, in the sense that the best way to keep people healthy is by uh, targeting aging itself. And I would be like, as a medical doctor, be very happy if the second uh, quote would come to fruition already so that uh, we, uh, in fact, can keep people healthier for longer by going uh, at uh, the root cause aging itself.